And a good way to think about it is to ask, ask um, yourself a question of why am I doing this? Right? Because oftentimes we would join the game, which is there available, because it's easy. Right? Well, I'm a poker player. I'm supposed to play poker, whatever. Yeah, it's small stakes. I'm just still going to play. Why? What is the bigger goal? What are, what are we trying to achieve today? Why are we jumping on there? How does it align with that bigger goal? Right? And oftentimes, that question alone is going to eliminate most of the crap out of your routine. that time again it's Pete Clark here with the Carrot Poker Podcast episode 102 and we have a very special guest with us joining us today in the Carrot Poker Studios he is the man behind one of my favorite podcasts one of the few poker podcasts that I actually listen to other than my own for my own ego boosting um, he goes by the name of Run Chucks Poker and has had many famous guests that I've got guest envy for this man certainly with the sort of people he's had on his show and we have him here today to talk to us all about the sort of benefits of poker that aren't just making money at the tables, but the sort of secondary benefits of getting into this field and where it can take you other than just financial glory at the tables. So Runchuck's Poker, welcome, man. How are you doing? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm pleased to be here uh, in your studios, and which is awesome because <laughs> uh, in the lockdown, everybody's on Zoom all the time. But Glad to be here, glad we're doing it, and glad to hear that uh, you actually enjoy my podcast. Yeah, no, I mean, you've had, I mean, I probably found it more so due to some of the guests that you had on there. Like, I remember, like, listening to the episode with Jennifer Shahadi, the chess player, and we'll get mm -hmm. into chess in a little while. Chess is a major passion of mine at the moment, perhaps even more so than poker, if my audience will forgive me for saying that. Um, but yeah, I think that was the first one I listened to, and then I've been checking out a few other ones. I think you do a a very good job of finding di a diverse and interesting array of, of guests. So so kudos to that. Um, tell us a bit more about, like, obviously you're also a, a coach, right? You work, you do a bit of work for Bluff the Spot and things, so you're, you're no stranger to sort of people trying to learn the game. Um, let, let's start by branching off into how poker can, how learning poker and that challenge and that endeavor can maybe help people in other ways. I think people are so quick to think poker's just a grind, right? We're just grinding up the ladder, 50, then 100, then 200, what's your BB per 100, what's your graph, as if this is all that matters. But what other skills do you think you've got from being in poker for, as you mentioned, you know, 12, 13 years now? Um, yeah, good question. I think it's important to understand that poker, especially if we're talking about online poker, and if we think about longevity, right? Because it's easy to do um, like a crazy run of six months, full focus on poker and burnout. But to do it with longevity over a period of multiple years where you're actually achieving some sort of semblance of a balance in life, where you have a clear separation between work and life, um, that is a skill in its own in a way because let's face it poker is a beautiful place to be in you have no customers you have no responsibilities you have basically no obligations you're your own boss you don't have a boss right so to be able to focus your energy and motivate yourself to deliver the results and keep grinding on through all the ups and downs that come with playing poker. If you manage to do that, that translates really nice into any other endeavor you might be undertaking later on in life. Yeah, absolutely. There's not many areas that you could enter that are going to put you through that emotional blender, so to speak, to quite the same extent that poker is. I mean, it's... Mm. And it's also, would you say it's quite a delusional field for a lot of people? Like the way poker distributes its rewards, its success and its failure and variance in general, can that 
give people like a the wrong impression of what poker is really about or where they are in the game perhaps like if you're a lawyer you probably know where you are in your career ladder but if you're a poker player how easy is it to just be totally out of touch with your true potential skill set and whether you're going in the right direction yeah and speaking of direction as well um if you're a lawyer and your boss tells you well you know what this is that subset of law that you need to um, specialize in that's what you do whereas in poker for example why is somebody a hold'em a cash game hold'em player did somebody tell them to do that how did they choose it why didn't they choose to do something else why don't they experiment with something else right a lot of poker players just put themselves in the bracket of I'm a Zoom player, I'm only playing cash games, I'm only playing No Limit Hold'em. Everything else is outside my area of expertise. I'm not going to spend any time on that. In many w cases, it might be the best approach. Just choose one field and full focus on that and um, you know, just completely double down on that effort. But that is only true if you selected the right field for you to begin with. Right? Because obviously there's different personality. Everybody comes into this game with their own baggage, with their own... Eventually you are who you are. And in this game you might discover yourself and some, some aspects of your personality which might make you better suited to play another game, another type of game, or to, to be a tournament player, to be a cash game player, to be a deep stack player, to be a short stack player. There are so many facets to this business that exploration and curiosity is, is so, so important, yet a lot of people just completely neglect it. Yeah, that's, that's so true. I mean, the number of students that, the number of people who have ever asked me, you know, would I coach them at a certain different format or it's just beyond MTTs and, you know, six max Zoom there's very little, I'd say less than 5% of poker players online play any other formats other than PLO, MTT, mm. Six Max Zoom. Um, and it's kind of, in a way, it's maybe even, it maybe even hurts, hurts the longevity of poker. Like, would you agree that the more variants of poker there actually were that became popular, the more poker would thrive? Or do you think that poker has to be accessible, it has to be no limit hold'em because that's, you know, what everyone knows of you if you dabbled in some other formats yourself? Yeah, I, I definitely dabbled in uh, all formats. Uh, I've played basically all games there are, at least tried all of them once. Um, I do think for the business of poker, it is important that there is a, an accessible game, which is not scary for people, right? Because if that accessible game at some point becomes, oh, it's completely solved and it's bot infested, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there is a deterrent for uh, new people to come into into the game, right? So as long as this game doesn't have a bad rep and is easily accessible, that's what we need. At the same time, for professional poker players, the variety of games. Like one aspect to it, if we just think about learning poker and studying the game, I feel like, especially working with my students, because um, back in the day, I, I used to work more with the high stakes. Uh, st well, to be honest, we still have a bunch of high stakes uh, students now when I'm doing more broad spectrum coaching with Love the Spot. But the high stakes guys would always go into different games putting themselves in a sort of beginner's mindset, discovering the basics, the fundamentals of poker through a medium of, of a different game, right? And it's very underrated by so many players, right? This, and it's just so accessible. Put yourself into a game that you're uncomfortable with to see whether you're actually understanding the the key concepts that underline the first principles of what it means to play sound poker. What does like what is a minimum defense frequency? How does the stack to pot ratio influence your play? How are the ranges constructed? Right for a specific pot size bet, uh, what is the distribution between um, value hands and bluff hands? 
all of these questions are basic kind of simple beginner's questions yet so many people don't know the answer yeah and yeah, when I you're constantly just playing in your own little pond of whatever your game is you are never forced to question your knowledge about these questions right because you're let's say you're already playing by some chart and then post flop you uh, trick yourself into thinking that you're you're studying in a GTO solution and you're trying to replicate it and whatever other bullshit, right? But eventually, how do you test whether you understand the basic principles? The easiest way is just try a game that you are you have no clue how to play it. And when you look at the best players in the world, what separates them from the rest is that you know you, you give some of the best guys out there, you tell them rules for a completely new game has been just invented, they're going to be pretty good level very quickly. Now, why is that? It's not that they're absolute geniuses. It's just that they have the basics. They, they know the basics so well. And the basics tra translate through one game to another game. Yeah. I think it's incredible to me you know, the number of private students that I have who will be at a certain level with some concepts, like they might be quite strong, for example, at having memorized that a solver will like to do X heuristic in, in Y spot. And maybe they mm. can even replicate that in game. They can sort of mimic it to quite a high extent. But when probed a bit deeper as to why this is the case, the understanding is almost nothing. So one that comes to mind yeah. off the top of my head would be we bet here very often because we have a big range advantage and the number of students that have been able to tell me when quizzed why having a big range advantage makes you want to bet really often they're not able to they'll just say something like because our range is doing well but it doesn't really get to the point of our expected value being higher of our fold equity being much higher than you, you know you spoke of mdf before um that's not a static thing right in reality ranges are not equal positions aren't equal evs are not equal each player is not entitled to exactly half the pot in every node of the game tree and but a lot of people learn sort of parrot learning things i feel like range advantage we get to bet often here let's bet range one third here and they're very good at that and they're very good at like copying a solver but when you get to the nuts and bolts of like why is that the case why is the solver betting every single hand well if it's getting 16% more fold equity than it would if the ranges were equal than it would by the pot odds, then there's a definite gain there that's really going on. So I do feel like solvers, some people ask me if solvers ruin the game. Um, absolutely not. Although people's play might get a bit better through parrot learning, I feel like there's just not enough emphasis on the absolute actual mechanics, the atomic structure of poker, the objective mm -hmm. structure of poker. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there's another thing I just want to add to that sure. solver uh, aspect, right? Because you've mentioned that a lot of people are just trying to mimic uh, the solver. Yeah. I think a big problem that a lot of people have, especially at the lower stakes and, and even some people at the mid stakes, they fool themselves into thinking that what they study is the solution, right? That is the GTO, that is the final word. Mm -hmm. It's most likely not. It's just the abstraction that you created, mm -hmm. right? In some games, obviously, we're getting, like, if we're talking about limit hold'em, sure, if you study those solutions, yeah, you're going to be GTO. That's pretty clear. In hold'em, um, it's questionable how close to GTO you actually are. When we go into games like PLO, you're pretty, pretty far. Pretty far. Because if we think about... The abstractions that you choose, first of all, for the preflop ranges, which are not completely accurate and don't actually reflect the real life because nobody can um, play those ranges to the T. Now, the next problem comes when you're choosing your bet sizes based on some abstraction that you think is right. But uh, who told you that this abstraction is indeed right? Did you run all the tests? Did you run multiple um, trees and compare the EVs and did you run all of them to a very significant, very high iterations per node? The answer is always no, right? So 
I think solvers are a fantastic tool. It's absolutely the best thing that happened to people who want to learn the game on a deeper level. But at the same time, it is not a template. It's not something that we can just follow to achieve the highest height. Sure, if you just mimic the solver output and you play mid stakes or, or low stakes, sure, you're going to do very good. But if you go into high stakes environment and try to mimic the solver, mm, good luck with that. Yeah, it's, it's almost like where people are making blunders, so where your opponents are frequently making plays, the mm. EV of which is much lower than what the correct play would be. You almost don't have to do very much to win. Um, it's a bit like in yeah. chess, right? If your opponent's hanging his queen every move, you don't really need to understand the nuances of a closed position and the plans that black needs to adopt in the, right. in the right. Benoni. You don't need to know any of these things in a particular opening or structure or anything because your opponent's giving you the game all the time. So I think that analogy works in poker too, where when your opponents yeah. stop blundering, when they stop betting second pair on the turn for no reason, having C bet the flop, you don't get that free handout. They don't sabotage their own EV so much anymore. And then if the mm -hmm. the mimicked version of GTO that you're trying to play is actually quite far away from what GTO should be, and moreover, it's far away in an obviously unbalanced way, that's when the sort of real strong players will, will see, um, not necessarily right away, but will eventually start to maybe just exploit you by predicting what your leaks will be because they're playing mm -hmm. against a player pool, you know, which has... Yeah certain fixed leaks you know everybody's different but we're all humans and a lot of the leaks we have are the same across the player pool so i do think that people need to, i think what you said is absolutely very insightful like people need to see that being given a template is only useful if you can understand the template because you're not humans are not good at replicating if you were a computer you'd be fantastic at memorizing you know if you were a computer i could give you twenty five thousand digit string of numbers and you could remember it tomorrow and feed it back to me but you're not and because you're human you see things semantically right you see things via meaning our brains only recognize things again via their meaning their semantic composition so right. trying to look at a pile sim without prescribing that meaning to it will never get you um very far at all right but there's even if we can take the chess analogy even further um, especially if we look at the high stakes environment in PLO, um, because obviously I think there's more um, similarities between the strategies at the high stakes players uh, in the in the Hold'em field. But in PLO, imagine if you have this template, right? You you mentioned the poker uh, the chess analogy. So let's say you're very comfortable with playing e4, and only against. Uh, you know, only open positions and you have a full template for that like whenever you're playing that you're you're really good but what if your opponent starts uh you know starting to push queen's gambit on you sicilian defense and whatnot creating closed positions you're really out of your depth all the templates that you have they don't really apply right if you understand those templates in chess originally at the high level and you know how to get out of the weeds and how to get the specific positions where, where you know what's up and how to understand the position then you're good but if you just memorize a specific path as soon as your opponent deviates you're really in trouble and I feel like this is clearly happening in um, let's say in mid stakes and lower if we look at the reg population Everybody's playing the same bet sizes, everybody's doing the same choices, everybody has the same kind of default game tree. So if you know that default game tree pretty good, you're going to be doing fine. That's why mimicking the solver output is probably pretty, pretty good way to go forward in the mid stakes and the low stakes. But when you go to play, let's say, a 10k game, PLO, six max you're gonna have five of your opponents with five different bet sizes pre-flop meaning five different pre-flop ranges um, some players are gonna make your life really difficult by having leads on every street check raises on every street balanced check raises no less right and just expanding the 
the decision tree, the game tree so much that whatever your little abstraction is that, that you think is the GTO, it can't handle all of these extra nodes, all of these extra branches of the tree that you're not accustomed to. So if you don't understand actually how to adjust to those, you're really out of your depth. And it could be that even if you've run a sim, so you've run an aggregate report and the donk bet frequency was very low in certain spots and you've decided, let's say for the sake of simplicity, to make your abstraction exclude that donk mm -hmm. bet that's that doesn't follow from that 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 donk bet is actually minus ev or like badly minus ev right so an opponent who's yeah. astute here could be adding these extra nodes like you say to put you outside of your comfort zone and maybe the theoretical cost if you reacted perfectly would be like microscopic it would be bad but it wouldn't be like that bad for them mm -hmm. but because you react so imperfectly it's actually now way higher EV to have this node in your strategy even if it's something that you take it's like in chess like this the games yeah. are so analogous in chess i play a lot of lines in the opening that are just offbeat and they, they don't give me the highest EV. theoretically they don't give me the most objective edge but they put my opponent in a position that he's probably never studied theory for mm -hmm. and from there i might be slightly worse with black or i might be even with white i might be equal with white but if I have a higher degree of familiarity across that position that I'm co constantly making sure I get, then my rating goes up, right? I just win more games. And it's like in poker, mm -hmm. if you're against a weaker player who doesn't have as good fundamentals, why not build a 30% donk lead frequency on this turn? It's not abhorrent to do it in objective terms. Um, and it's not covered by anybody's abstraction. I think it's crazy these days the amount of people who only bet 70 like at 50 nl 100 nl a lot of these stakes i teach people don't bet anything other than 75 percent pot on the turn in the river they don't even no. have river blocks they don't even have turn blocks they're missing not just optional extra branches but they're missing like gigantic parts of of a gto solution mm -hmm. absolutely but there is a risk there for somebody who hasn't doesn't have good fundamentals to start tinkering with the simple strategies and try to make them more complex mm. if you actually don't know what you're doing you're probably creating more problems for yourself uh, and eventually it's going to hurt your EV right so I mm. don't necessarily advise people uh, which are still not very comfortable with their baseline right because yeah. we often talk about well exploit that exploit this tendency exploit that tendency if you don't know your baseline, how can you exploit? You're always guessing about, yep. oh, I'm deviating like this. Deviating from what? If you can't tell what is your default go-to, go then all you're saying is just guesswork. There is no math to it. There is no, no proof, right? And unfortunate truth with the solvers and all the other study tools is that a lot of people just delegate the responsibility for the decision to this tool or the, the template, mm. right? And how often do you hear somebody say, oh, no, the check race here with this hand was good because the <laughs> solver says so? Yeah. Really? Right? What else does the solver say? Right? What are the other hands that you're supposed to check raise? If all of a sudden you're only check raising the correct value hands, but you don't add any bluffs, do you really think you're, you're doing all that good? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean... It's, it's a bit like the, the analogy that eventually a room full of chimps will produce Shakespeare, right, with a bunch of yeah. typewriters. Right. Like, you know, you can stumble upon a line that happens to be um, coherent in GTO as, like, it's an accepted strategy in conjunction with other lines that you would do with other hands. But if you fold mm -hmm. every hand in every spot, many of your folds will be good. If you raise and bet every time you have the chance, many of your bets and raises will be good. If you call every single river bet, you will make a lot of good calls. But what is the point in looking at one of those individually and deriving some kind of satisfaction from it? Um, yeah. Question for you. What's the, what's the right balance then, in your opinion, between simplifying while you're learning and keeping your nodes restricted in, instead of you know doing yourself more harm by complicating the game tree, as you mentioned, compared with actually learning fundamentals? should a student put his game on hold until he's actually understanding and able to answer why all of the fundamental notions are the case? Or 
is it okay to put in a lot of volume with the more simplified game tree until you've done that? Um, I would think it depends on the person uh, and depends on what's the starting point, right? Because when we talk about somebody lacking fundamentals, I'm not talking about only the the mid stakes or low stakes guys. Some of the mm -hmm. high stakes guys that I talk to, they also lack fundamentals, mm -hmm. right? And some of them actually know that. And then still don't care because they're crushing in in other aspects and, and uh, might might be just a bit too too lazy to invest a lot of work for what they feel as small returns. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, I'd say simplification. Because coming back to your original question, whether it makes sense for somebody to implement the simplified trees or before they get the fundamentals right don't go there, mm -hmm. I'd say those things go hand in hand. When you're studying the simplified solutions, when you're studying the simplified game trees, you're supposed to approach everything almost as if uh, it's a scientific research, right? So put your hypotheses uh, as to why do you think the solver is doing what it's doing, and then test the hypotheses. And oftentimes, a lot of those hypotheses also have some sort of foundation in the theory, in just the underlying mathematics of poker, so to say, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're studying the simplified game trees, you're inadvertently going to also stumble upon the need of understanding some, some concepts uh, from pure mathematical perspective, right? And a lot of people might say, oh, it's boring, I don't want to study the math, you know, whatever. Well, good for you, but I'm not talking about knowing the exact percentages or, you know, down to like whatever digit we're talking about or memorizing that, oh, in this situation with such and such a bet size, I'm supposed to bet 62.5% of my range. I'd say like two thirds is roughly what you're aiming for right it doesn't matter like these numbers don't matter so i'm not advising people to just go down into the details so much that they get lost in the details but get the big picture understand why things happen why the solver plays and chooses to play its range in specific nodes the way it does and before you're very comfortable with that simplistic baseline adding more complexity to the tree is probably detrimental. It's only going to hurt. Because like, if you have to learn a game tree where on the flop, there's only one bet size, for example. Compare it to a flop where there's three bet sizes. It's a completely different tree. It's, it's vastly, vastly bigger than other more complex tree. And there's going to be many, there are going to be many nodes where you are absolutely out of your depth because nobody has enough time to, to study it in depth. All right? But then if you have the good fundamentals, you can actually figure out the, the answers yourself on the fly. And I think the best players out there, they don't necessarily know the solver outputs for each node. Most of them haven't even run the solver outputs for each node. But they can get pretty close with their estimates. Yeah. That's the thing I've found is training in, in programs like Lucid GTO, like sort of taking a solver output, which is basically a chart that's not super accessible, right? Like humans mm -hmm. struggle enough. Like when you're in game, you struggle enough to come up with the best strategy with that one hand that you're dealt um, looking at, you know, 1,326 combos instead of one is probably not going to make poker easier for you to learn in, in the sense that in game you'll be able to, to use the output. So I think like just training in a trainer for me has just been one way in which like taking GTO and making it replicate in game has actually made me a lot more precise with estimates. So like now if I'm going through a sim, personally, I just find that like on the turn, I'll just have a way better feel for how often a hand is supposed to bet, check, etc., than I would mm -hmm. before I started using the trainer and was just looking at the charts because the way we learn is not actually, again, as a species, we're not computers. We don't learn in the same way that Pio teaches. Pio teaches 
A solver teaches with a chart a laid out grid of frequencies and numbers and EVs and equities. We don't learn by internalizing all of that data. We learn by doing and seeing why we're doing. We learn by a simple process of input, reasoning, output, and then consequence. And I think when you're in a trainer, for example, it's a better way of teaching that. But yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that what the strong players do is they estimate something close to a, a theoretically sound game and that allows them to deviate with ruthless efficiency because they're so fluid, right? They're so like able to do it on the fly, like you said. Let's talk other skills. Right. What skills does poker give you or what's it given you personally that you didn't have before you dedicated a significant part of your life to this game? Well, it's a tough question, right? Because how do we know? How would I would I have developed those skills mm. otherwise anyway, right? But I think one thing that strikes me as very true and a lot of poker players whom I talk to about this question seem to agree that understanding that how much variance there is in everything in life, that's something that sets poker players ap apart from, let's say, the general population. Because if we start looking at things, there's variance in absolutely everything. Every minor or major detail of life, there's some variance, non-zero variance. And living with that understanding allows you to make better decisions in some aspects of life. But also, you know, be perceived as a bit of an asshole in some other aspects of life when, you know, somebody, somebody actually complains about uh, something that you purely see as, well, that, that's just variance, mate, and get over it, right? Mm. They don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely one. It's not a skill, per se. It's just an understanding of just the underlying variance everywhere. The other understanding sort of which is probably you know a lot of people outside of poker also have that but just the general sense of incompetence right we like there are so many people doing their job who are completely incompetent not fit f for doing that job and that is probably important to to remember sometimes you know because it saves you some stress because uh, how many how many people get really pissed at customer support or something i'm like oh my god like how bad they are yeah yeah they're bad get over it people don't necessarily like just because somebody is uh you know has a nice title or whatever doesn't mean that they deserve that title and same goes in poker just because somebody plays high stakes or mid stakes or whatever they play doesn't mean that they're actually super smart or anything. Everybody has their own problems. Everybody has their own good days or bad days. Um, and in, in, in the end of the day, it's about the grind. And as long as you focus on what you're supposed to focus, uh, you know, that that's the only thing that you should be concerned about, with. But in terms of skills, let me think about the skills. Well, I, I, I think poker forces you to train your focus, right? Because obviously in the session or in the study session or, or the playing session or any form of poker that you do, we are pushing ourselves constantly to be at the high uh, alertness state, full focus, and recognize hopefully, because that's definitely a skill to recognize when you don't have the focus, when you're sort of autopiloting, uh, where you're more prone to tilt because you're not really fully there. So eventually, at least for me, poker definitely taught me to push my boundaries for what I'm comfortable with in terms of um, alertness and, and focus and at the same time be more introspective and catch myself of uh, catch myself um, in the moments where I'm I'm not fully there when I need a break when I need to step away and I think it definitely translates in 
other business endeavors that I'm involved in right now, this ability to catch yourself and, and say, oh, you know what? No, I need a break. Like, nothing good is going to happen if I just continue plowing on. I need to refresh, and five minutes later, I'm going to be back, and I'm, I'm going to be back at it, right? And, and that's definitely... That's definitely a skill that I learned through poker. Yeah. The most recent example in my life of that has definitely been like, I think I mentioned to you actually, I said to you, between like one and three, I'm like a zombie. So I'd rather not do mm. the interview at that time in the afternoon. Yeah. And that's not, that's not anything to do with this being a podcast or this being, it doesn't matter what it is, like whatever activity I try and do at that time, I just know that I'm going to be inefficient, I'm going to be in a bad mood, I just go through a slump, it's circadian rhythm, it's genetic, it's whatever it is, and that time of day, I just want to be resting, watching something, going for a short nap, meditating, maybe doing something as counterintuitive as this sounds, like going for a run or something that's not mentally Mm -hmm. stimulating, and then firing on all cylinders when I know I can do that. Um, Do you feel like there's do you feel like you're quite good now at understanding the patterns of when you're focused and likely to perform at a high level and when you're not? Or do you think there's actually some, like like mine is a pattern, right? It's a certain time of day, but is there a random fluctuation? Is it just like some days for some reason unbeknownst to you, you're just unfocused for whatever reason? You just have to like pick up on that in an ad hoc way as well. Um, mm-hmm. Or does it follow like quite a regimented pattern? Um when it comes to poker, chess, or any any game where you've got to focus? Yeah, good question. Well, I can answer for myself. I, I, I suppose everybody is different, and uh, you know, a lot of factors come into play. But for myself, well, first of all, I, I think it's important for people to realize uh, it's okay to take time off, right? And a lot of poker players force themselves to, due to fear of missing out or whatever, you know, oh, there's a fish, I have to play. Uh, oh, it's... Tuesday, I have to play, whatever excuses we come up with, right? Whereas the idea of I'm not feeling good, I, I, I'm not going to play today, that's controversial. They were like, oh no, I can't do that. And I, I'd say it's okay to take time off. It's important to take time off. Now, that being said, for myself, um, to manage, let's say, to manage that energy, to, to manage the alertness and, and my presence at the tables, I found routines very helpful. So specific times of day allocated to poker, um, specific times of day allocated to studying poker, right? Through trial and error, sort of arriving at the times of day when I'm actually feeling more alert and more receptive to new information, more... more um, capable of focusing for a longer time, right? And so routines are definitely really, really useful. Now, obviously, with the high-stakes poker environment, the unfortunate reality is that even if I want to play a specific time of day, there's really high chance that there's just no game at that specific time of the day. So, yeah, I have to be present and ready but um, it's not a given that I'm going to have a game, right? So oftentimes at the high stakes environment, especially for the last few years, is just a lot of waiting. You're sitting at the table, you're waiting. Um, in my case, when I'm actually going for it and I'm really grinding, I'm, I'm trying to be the one sitting at the table. So I'm fighting for and I'm happy to play three handed or whatever it takes to keep my seat so that I don't have to constantly check the lobby and try to uh, win the waiting list game, which is impossible. Um, So yeah, we have to, you know, at the higher levels, you have to be flexible in a sense that, yeah, it's not only about, I'm only going to play when I feel like it, because then, well, chances are you're not going to play enough. So you have to be capable of switching on and switching off. And I think that switching off is really important because for myself, I found that if I'm actually grinding the high stakes, uh, I would refuse even a good table of, let's say, even if it's like a 1K PLO game uh, and I have no other game running, I would probably not join 
or most likely I would not join. If I have the intention of no, I'm today I'm in the waiting mode. I know there's a bigger game gonna the bigger game's gonna happen today, so I need to be fresh for that. Right? Because we only have so much attention and focus available to us throughout the day. And if you exhaust yourself in some mm. crappy game before the, the big time hits, then well, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. I found that the more time I spend clicking another bullet game on chess.com, the nothing I don't gain anything from playing three minute or one minute chess really. Mm -hmm. And I have less energy left to do work or even study chess in a meaningful way, like chess and poker are like the main things in my life. And I feel like with both of them, uh, it's very easy to squander time. There's so many pitfalls, especially in this day and age, right? Like techno technological distractions. Uh, you're one button away from playing a game that's going to absorb hours of your life. One click can designate what happens to the next hour or two hours of your life or whatever. So discipline is a huge part of this as well. Professional poker player or just advancing in any game or pursuit. Mm. Yeah. Um, and a good way to think about it is to ask ask um, yourself a question of why am I doing this? Right? Because yeah. oftentimes we would join the game which is there available because it's easy right well i'm a poker player i'm supposed to play poker whatever yeah it's small stakes i'm just still gonna play why what is the bigger goal what are, what are we trying to achieve today why are we jumping on there how does it align with that bigger goal right and oftentimes that question alone is going to eliminate most of the crap out of your routine including you know i'm and i'm very i used to be very guilty of uh, just wasting my life at playing the bullet games the bullet chess right which is just such a time sink because there's like there's no way you learn anything uh from playing bullet chess apart from how to mo move your mouse really quickly and that that's about it right, that but vital it, survival skill of moving the mouse yeah yeah and then eventually obviously it's so draining because uh, it's never just one game as well right because you end up playing like an hour or two hours or whatever and there's an equivalent of that in poker as well because you know some people would just end up playing way too long of a session without even questioning uh, why are we playing right now a like, simple question of if I wasn't at this table right now would I join this table if the seat was available would I take it you know and how often do we find ourselves in a situation where we played way too long, we lost the focus, we eventually start tilting towards the end, and we know it's going to happen, but yet we still do it. Same as I still keep playing bullet chess mm -hmm. uh, on an occasion. Because it's just, you know, when, when you don't have a specific routine in place, a specific discipline to keep you in check, it's too easy to say yes to things. And it's much harder to say, no, no, I'm not going to join this table. No, I need to quit this game because I'm tired. I don't care that I'm down. I don't care that, uh, you know, I have a feeling that I'm going to get it all back. I don't care that it's the biggest fish and he's never, ever going to play poker ever again. So I'm never going to get my bunny back. I don't care about all that. I'm tired. I should quit. That's yeah. basically what it should boil down to. Did we evolve with this level of choice? in our evolutionary history have we ever had so many instantly accessible avenues of gratification available at the click of a button before probably not right so yeah. is it tough for human beings inherently to show restraint in this online world given that we probably didn't have that much choice when we were coming up through the ranks of evolution as a species mm. i think it's naturally a tough one um Cool. Let's talk a little bit more about chess then, because I've All been right. trying to get people from my Discord into this game that I know you and I, you and I are both very passionate about, and I've been trying to sort of show people that chess and poker are actually very, very alike um, in many ways. They're very different in other ways as well. Um, what's your kind of background in chess, and how does it relate to your background in poker? Well... I got into chess before I got into poker because I got into chess from a very, very young age. I, um, I never achieved anything in chess competitively. Uh, I never had the drive to achieve anything in chess competitively, but I always enjoyed the game. It was always 
part of uh, my hobby list, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the one of the reasons I got into poker to begin with my, is my love of games. I just like to play games. Uh, and I like the process of playing the games. To me, the drive is not so much the trophy or the result or the whatever number go up kind of thing. It's more about the process, the process of experiencing the game, growing within the game, understanding the game from a different perspective. And it happens in poker or any game, right? Any game that we play, it's such a beautiful moment where sort of the clouds clear and you realize, wow, now I know more about this game, something that I didn't even know exists within this game, right? And it happens really quickly and really easily in chess because at first it's just a board and then you know you get from one layer of understanding to another and another really quickly in ch in, in poker obviously this growth is much slower and mu much less tangible because mm -hmm. uh, you might start fooling yourself into thinking like oh man I, now I understand the concept of CBAT I, I, I have it, I really nailed it now, I really know it. It might not be true. Whereas, you know, once you understand the concept in chess, let's say, oh, now I understand uh, some, you know, how to play open positions and the importance of um, controlling the long diagonal and why is that and how should I go into that specific pattern in my games, right? Well, that's more tangible. So, how do these two games complement each other? It's hard to say, but I know that most people who love poker end up liking chess a lot once they really put in the time to go over the first barrier of um, understanding the very basics. So yeah. basically, as soon as the game becomes interesting to them, yeah. uh, it's instantly a great game for for poker players and obviously chess players a lot of them do enjoy poker a lot and and card games in general right so there's there's there are a lot of similarities and i think those similarities come from a fact that most of us who truly love the game we love the game for the right reasons we're we're playing poker and we're playing chess because we want to challenge ourselves and we want to grow within the game, right? And it's and it's just beautiful to grow within poker and, and grow within chess, et cetera, et cetera. And, but then again, it comes to the drive. Let's say the, the high stakes players, um, some of the guys that I've talked to who were considering getting into chess and we had a couple discussions with them about chess and eventually they were just like, no, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, and knowing them, I know it's a great decision not to do it because a lot of the high achievers in, in poker are prone to make this mistake of if we start doing anything, we get into it with a lot of ambition. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just be okay. I want to be really good. And then it becomes a really big time sink because to become very good at chess, well you're in for a journey because you're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of time studying so some people just steer away from chess for that reason because they know that they're quite obsessive in in their endeavors and they are very ambitious and they don't they don't want to create a time sink for themselves where there's just basically a lot of their life is gonna disappear into the this new hobby but i'd say that's not a majority of people so for for somebody who just wants to explore a new game and, and find perhaps like a sandbox kind of intellectual mm. pursuit because in yeah. poker you know you can't play poker without money at stake that's just it's what's the point right but um so poker is always for professional poker players it's always work yeah. very rarely just um a kind of wind down cool down session after work but chess can be that game and also like for myself i don't know how is it for you maybe 
maybe you feel the same way, but I sometimes, before I start my poker session, I would play a game of chess just to see where my level of focus is at. Yeah, yeah. Just to see if, okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking clearly. I'm, you know, I'm focused on the moves. I'm, I'm not, my mind is not wandering around. So, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I can play, can play some poker now. So it's a pretty good indication because, listen, if you, if you can't focus in chess, what chances do you have focusing in poker, right? And, of course, I mean, it's natural for us to get into the groove after a certain amount of time, let's say, just because I wasn't focused in chess doesn't mean I'm, that's it, I'm not playing poker today. Probably means that I'm approaching my session with a lot of caution and I'm going to be more introspective and more process-oriented considering every decision that I make until I get into the groove of, okay, I got it. I'm, I'm in the zone right now. Yeah. That's a, a very nice little test the water idea there, because I can guarantee you that if I'm, I would say my chess level is extremely prone to fluctuation, like maybe more so than most people I've ever played, talked to chess about or played against. Cause I think like right now I'm, I'm five minute rating is about 1725 or something on chess.com but i would say when i'm at my peak i'm probably playing about 1800 strength and when i'm not when i'm playing badly i might be playing 1500 strength honestly like it's very possible that sometimes i am like 300 points away from my peak not because i'm totally sleep deprived or drunk or you know on my phone while also playing poker or anything like that but just because my brain's not in the right place so if there can be 300 rating points difference between me at one time of the day and me at another time of the day, you know, why jump into a poker session until you're aware of which of those, are you an 1800 poker player right now or are you a 1500 poker player right now? Because I've often thought about how the poker grading ladder, how an ELO would work for poker, but I would think that, I don't know, I'll ask, I'll ask you about this in a minute, I think it's an interesting question, but why jump into a session when there are certain warm-ups or drills you could do that could increase your elo whether it be in poker or chess by by a few hundred points there's there's little rituals we could do right there's things we could yeah. do to maybe get the brain into the right the right place how strong is someone that beats 200 zoom over the long term on poker stars as an elo rating this is a really unfair question i apologize for it in advance but i think it's a fascinating topic how would ELOs work in poker? Not practically, but how high would they be for certain levels of success? Mm. Yeah, interesting. I, um, you know, I always struggle with this idea of measuring or ranking players in poker. Mm. I think it's unfair and unnecessary. Um, unfair for the reasons mm. of there is no metric, there is no set metric. So we're comparing, or we're always comparing apples to oranges and whatever, right? But in terms of how strong is a Zoom 200 player, once again, like compared to what? Compared, to, like in a big scheme of things, really strong, right? Because obviously anybody who can beat, comfortably beat Zoom 200 is a very good player who understands the underlying principles might have a few blind spots in mm. uh, in the fundamentals but in general is on the right track and, and doing something right so, so they're at least an expert or master maybe then like they're probably over 2000 would we say if we had yeah, to make yeah. this comparison i would i would even go as far as saying that they might be yeah a master like an international yeah. master or something like that right mm -hmm. then then we go like, because who would be the grandmasters here? Because yeah. it probably anybody who is beating comfortably, beating, um, I don't know. I, I don't like to put a stake on, oh, I'm comfortably ble beating uh, whatever, 2K PLO. Well, okay, what time of day, which site, uh, mm -hmm. what are the opponents, right? It's not just, it's not a set thing, right? It, totally. it, and it fluctuates over time, you, yeah. you know, so... It's hard to put like those brackets on there, but I'd say anybody who beats high stakes is a GM level. But if we think about chess GMs, there's the GMs and there's the super GMs. Mm. And the gap between the GM and super GM is insanely huge, mm. 
right? In bo both in terms of how much work goes into it, how how big the team, the super GMs have. Because like, look, most most GMs they don't have a team. They might have study partners at best, right? They don't have the team. They don't have the finances to to do the same type of work with some of the best in in the industry. They have a lot of support. Right, and they need every bit of it, even though they are already the, by far the best player. Like, if you think about Carlson, mm. right, the best player in the world, arguably at the moment. Um, I mean, he has a huge team. He has private solvers, private chess engines. Right, he has everything that you could dream of, and he has so much support. And yet, he is the best. Right, so if the best guy in the industry needs all the support and coaches he can get, obviously everybody everybody else needs that as well to get anywhere close to his level. But the question is, can they afford it? And obviously they probably can't because those things are not cheap. Right, so eventually the the big teams, the 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 big support, that's only like the privilege of the top five, top ten maybe in the world, and that's about it. And I feel like that's somewhat similar in poker as well. Yeah. I think there's always been a tradition of the elite minds in poker working together closely, grind houses, you know, networks of extremely, exclusive networks of extremely strong players. This is something that's always existed in poker as well, and for good reason, because that we do learn socially. I'm always talking about this in my podcast and with students that if they shut themselves up in a room and they don't have the chess equivalent of seconds or people to, to go through their games with them and stuff, like they're really putting themselves at a severe disadvantage. So if you're listening to this and you don't really have any, po or any poker friends or you don't talk to anyone about the game, fix that because having that network is super important. Yeah, that, that makes me feel better about, about life, the fact that you think a 200 NL winning player would be like an international master that, that makes me feel good i've always wondered about it like i'd love to be an international master at something it's never going to happen in chess for me probably although i did hire a coach recently and even that has been just like blown my mind wide open just like the way that he's he's an im and the way he sort of thinks about positions and the, i think the thing that really kind of jolted me awake um and has made me already start improving a bit of chess like i can already feel it is that you have this idea, right, that when you're not that strong at poker or when you're not that strong at chess, you think that the really strong players must be calculating immense amounts of moves like supercomputers, right? They must be, like, mm. seeing the pile grids in their head. They must be calculating 12 move sequences all the time and computing multiple variations in a few minutes. But he, although he can calculate much better than me, obviously, it's more just about noticing. I think the concept of noticing... And picking out what's really important in a chess position mm -hmm. is highly analogous to the concept of noticing the factor most relevant to your EV in a hand of poker. For example, we're in a position the other day in a game I'd, I'd shown him that I lost and he sort of just said, why don't you just play like A3 here? It's a really innocuous pawn move that just like made sure everything was okay before I did anything else. Mm -hmm. I was like, that wouldn't even occur to me. I'd never, never even think about A3. He said, but yeah, but this position... It's so calm and you have such a good advantage here that you could just you this now becomes the most important thing. Just stopping any future infiltration becomes more important than any active mm -hmm. plan. And I think it's that noticing of the right detail that's so key. Um, would you agree that like poker players aren't necessarily like computational masterminds? They're not all rain man. Like a lot of them are just very astute at seeing the poker position for what it is and very quickly picking out the most relevant factors and then maybe even just doing computations that weaker players could do equally well from there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's always a question about the questions we ask, uh, ask ourselves uh, when we're making a decision, right? Because even if you had to have a set decision-making process, Still, what are the questions that you're trying to answer to yourself before you make the decision, right? Because we have limited time. We, we have, like, whatever, a couple of seconds, a few seconds in the online environment to make our decision. So what we focus on is going to determine what answers are we getting, 
right? Because eventually you kind of, as the saying goes, you only hit what you aim for. Like, well, hopefully, right? Because, you know, it can be not necessarily universally true. But with the analogy of uh, the I am seeing the bigger picture and, and asking the right questions, that's, that's the difference. He knows how to write, uh, ask the right question. That question of E3, is it a good move, hasn't even occurred to you, right? Because you have the urgency of, no, I need to, I have the advantage, I have the initiative, I need to mm. keep pushing, 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 mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But for him, it's natural to consider those options as well. So I think what sets uh, the the top players apart from from the rest is the ability to know what's the most important question we need to answer in the moment, right? Because sometimes that question has nothing to do with uh, your sort of set procedure for making a decision because maybe there's some new information that you just gained because maybe that new information is, hey, this guy never check raises. Mm. All of a sudden he check raised. So what does it mean about his range? How did his range change? Like what can I infer from this new information? And the new information usually doesn't fit in any templates that we have. So what happens if we just, you know, how often does it happen that somebody just clicks the call on the river because whatever, because the solver says so. Oh, I'm supposed to call with the, you know, I have two pair, I have to call. Yeah, you have to call against the balanced range, but what if your opponent only has the nuts there and nothing else? And you can have high degree of confidence in that information. Should you still be calling two pair? That's obviously a losing call, right? So if we don't even consider that new piece of information, if we don't even seek out the new piece of information, we're just leaving a lot of value on the table a lot of the time. Right, and and the best players are very good at just asking the right questions and focusing on what's important. And recently, I had Fedor Holtz on the podcast, and and he really talked through his thinking process in in a lot of detail, and it was eye opening to, for a lot of uh, listeners, and also was somewhat similar to to my conversation with Raúl González, who, um, if you know, is one of the yeah, mixed uh, games or high, high stakes uh, mixed games players in the mm -hmm. world, right? So the way their mind works, eventually it boils down to the questions they ask themselves in the decision, right? And um, I I would highly recommend to, to anyone to listen to Fedor's interview because yeah, this this guy definitely is uh, is truly inspiring in the way he approaches the learning process and the thinking process and and using the information to his advantage yeah it's like i said to my coach that day when we had that lesson i said every not every time but most of the times that you suggest an improvement to a move i made you're not talking about a move i've rejected because you're not talking about a move i've even considered like it was mm -hmm. just nowhere on my roadmap at all and yeah. another way of um formulating that what i just said there would be to say that i didn't ask I didn't generate the appropriate question. Um, right, there's a right. saying apparently in Russian that the question is half of the answer because you'll yeah. never get to the yeah. answer without the right question in the first place. So I think all poker players definitely do check out um, Run Chuck's podcast. It's, it's a lot of inspiring guests on there. I've not actually seen the one with with Fedor Holtz, but I'll be sure to check that out. Um, and you'll definitely enjoy one with uh, Vladimir Kramnik. So mm. because of your passion for chess and mm. I mean Kramnik is the legend of the game he's a seven time or six time or seven time I forgot world champion in chess there's you know it's a handful of people uh, who made world champion more than one year and uh, he's the guy who beat Kasparov when nobody thought Kasparov is beatable right so he is just an absolute legend of the game truly inspiring person and a lot of the things that we talked about will resonate with you both in your endeavor in, in exploring chess and, and trying to learn more about chess and also learning in general. Because I can, I can give you a, a little example of an idea that you might find interesting because at some point when you reach a level of proficiency in chess, uh, there's going to come, come a time when you're going to be working more and more with the engines and you're going to look for the best moves, 
right? And what Kramnik suggested that he sees, especially in the younger generation of chess players, the problem of just selecting the best chess engine move and, and taking it as, you know, on, a, on its face value. Oh, it's better, so I'm just going to have to play that without questioning whether they are comfortable with the type of position that this move is going to result in. Because mm -hmm. if the chess engine thinks something is best, it's because it can execute all the lines that go from there, from that point onwards. But if you're not able to do the same, it's probably not a good line for you. And it's the same with poker, exactly the same thing of, you know, making a better EV decision, a more complex EV decision and going completely out of your depth already on the flop. Just because the solver prefers that line by a small margin mm -hmm. doesn't actually mean it's a good idea for you. Yeah, totally. And especially if you're trying to tweak your game every time you get such feedback from a solver, you're just creating mayhem and chaos, right? Like There's nothing wrong with sacrificing little bits of EV here and there so that your game is progressing in a way that you can always control, you can always see and you can always be you can always know where you are within the game tree as you've studied it rather mm. than i know exactly what you mean yeah i mean yeah. i used to analyze games with an engine and i would find it saying oh no you just play you know rook takes a7 here and i'd be like what the hell is that move and then you look at it and then having played this move i then have to play eight perfect moves to survive an onslaught so i can then end up in a position where i can make a further weird positional move to just mm. be okay when there's probably a route for being okay that's slightly less okay and maybe like slightly worse, maybe it's point minus point zero five instead of minus point zero one, but I can do it in one move. So the engine would rather wade through twelve or thirteen Im near impossible positions and get every move right just to emerge with a small small gain. So and it's yeah. the same in poker solvers. That solvers and chess engines, they don't care how they get there all they care about is the destination and just because a solver can reach a destination or a chess engine can it doesn't mean that you can and it's it's very counterproductive i haven't analyzed a single chess game with a lesson since i started working with this i am actually yeah. not a single one because i realized how much harm it was doing yeah. and it's done my students a lot of harm in poker as well I, I say to them you know don't pick up a solver until you're proficient at how to use the solver because it will harm more than it will help initially until you become good at using it yeah. yeah yeah and peter i apologize if you hear the noise it's it's my son banging on the door all good <laughs> we're gonna wrap up anyway don't worry it's um it's been a really thrilling conversation but we are reaching the hour 10 mark so i'll let you get on with your day um where should people go to to check out your podcast and check out more from you in the poker landscape um well uh yeah highly appreciate if people go and check the podcast it's um, available on youtube um, search for run checks poker uh, it's also available on all podcast platforms on spotify apple podcasts and elsewhere same uh, run checks uh, run checks podcast is what you're supposed to search there um so yeah anywhere there uh, and i'm on twitter as well so if anybody wants to send me a message um go ahead awesome yeah I'll just um further that by saying that it's it's definitely a very interesting well presented podcast with a, a wide array of fascinating guests so i'll be checking out the the fader halls one myself as, as i said i haven't haven't even caught that yet mm. but run chucks poker thank you very much for coming on the show man been one of my favorite episodes that i've done recently for sure and um i hope you continue to make progress in, in all of your, your passions in poker and, and business and in chess. Awesome, Peter. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. Uh, good questions. We explored some things that I don't often think about. And uh, I feel like after this conversation, my first thing on to-do list is play some chess. Uh, it's really <laughs> a beautiful game. And uh, we should probably meet up for a game online at some point and have some fun. Absolutely, yeah, it could be really cool. I plan on streaming a bit more chess in the future as well and sort of combining it with the poker audience. I'd love to, as I said, get more people into it. So I'll be in touch and yeah, awesome. stay tuned for, for Carrots versus Runchucks, the chess battle All for right. rolls. All right, awesome. Pride rolls, of course, pride <laughs> rolls. All right, well, sounds good, yeah, absolutely. All right, man, thanks again. Have a good day. Thanks, you too.